Uh, let's try it this way and see if this will work. Yes. Okay. I bet you that the first blank is a memory blank. Could be. All right. Uh, on the notes, you have the Word document to follow along. The, the Word document is a creation of the outline of the keynote, so it should follow along directly with the outline of the slides. You just click on the blank and replace the, um, replace the blank with the actual word from the outline. This is weird not handwriting. Well, this, there's a, there, this is a longer set of notes, so I wanted it to go by a little bit faster than what I did last time. Get that buzz out of here. Should we copy and paste this? You can either do that or save it as a, a separate file, whichever is easiest for you. It doesn't matter to me. Okay. Are we taking all these today? hope so. Okay. We're going to see how far we can get. Okay, on the, uh, the structure of the play, what you deal with, we, we dealt a little bit with this yesterday on the introduction part, talking about what a memory play actually was. Oh, yeah. On the memory play, we talk about it not being as reliable because the author or the playwright is creating the events of the story basically as best he can remember. So when he's writing a story about the Glass Menagerie, he's basing it on events that he can remember from his lifetime. And sometimes he remembers things really well, and other times he does not remember very well. So the details are a little bit of a problem sometimes. The part that is most important for you to underline or highlight as you go along, the second bullet point there, what the problem with a memory play is, is that sometimes it is not as real as the person would like for it to be. So when Tennessee Williams is creating an event, for example, in the first scene of the play, when they're around the kitchen table and they're having memories about uh, their mother growing up and how the, how the mother met her father and things like this, sometimes the memory is not as accurate as what they can possibly want to have for the play. And so the second bullet point. And, and so the ideas that he presents in the play may not be 100% accurate. There's also a possibility that there could be some exaggeration, and there could also be some bias uh, that is put into this. So let's say that you're the author of the play, you're remembering a scene from your life when you were growing up, uh, and that scene was not a pleasant memory for you, that you tried to kind of block it out or forget it. If you're gonna be realistic in creating your play, you're gonna put all the facts in there, whether it shows you in a good light or a bad light. As the main character of the play, also acting as the narrator, he can choose to intentionally forget things that might not be flattering for him. And so when the main character of Tom is here and he's presenting you his version of the story, you have to keep in mind he may intentionally leave things out or maybe not intentional, accidentally leave things out that don't show him in a very good light along the way. Now, he's gonna, Tennessee Williams is going to use uh, two different things in the play and use them quite a bit. This is one of the few plays that we're going to actually look a little bit more at the stage directions uh, than we normally would. And so you're going to have two things that he wants to use a lot. This is where Tennessee Williams always designed this play to be viewed more so than to be read. So we'll see clips along the way or maybe in the full film uh, toward the end. He likes to use what's called a screen device. Uh, in the 1940s, this was a brand new concept. What playwrights were having trouble with was if they wanted to set a certain mood in the 1940s, the budgets and the technology was obviously not the same as it is nowadays. So if you wanted to have like mood lighting, that was pretty easy to do in whatever time period. But if you wanted to have a, a picture in the audience's mind and you wanted to display that picture somewhere on the set, you literally had to draw a picture or find a photograph and make that photograph part of the actual stage because the technology was pretty low back in the 1940s. So what he created was like a movie projection screen uh, that he could record things in very crude video form of 1940s video. And that, it, that image would be projected up on the screen during particular scenes of the play. And so if he wants, for example, the idea of um, the disease that uh, Amanda suffers, which is called pleurosis, her nickname, of course, was Blue Roses. So there would be a picture of Blue Roses projected up on the screen during times where he wants the audience to focus on Amanda. He would also use music quite a bit. Uh, and if you read the stage directions very closely as he goes through, whenever Amanda shows up on stage at a very emotional time, he'll actually have the music of the, uh, the, the score of Glass Menagerie kind of playing in the background. He got a lot of credit in his time frame as being one of the first playwrights to really have a soundtrack uh, going on during a live performance. It's really common nowadays. You go see a play, you got an orchestra pit in front, they play the music like you would see, or they have it recorded nowadays, and they're playing over the different scenes. Very uncommon in the 1940s for that to happen. Now, a lot of times in his time period, they would create the play first, 
And then after it was a success, they would go back and add music to it and then sell the music like a soundtrack. But it would never usually happen during the live performance. Now, the major themes. Next two or three slides, really, really important. If you're highlighting stuff, make sure you know what themes are present. You will see these again uh, probably on a uh, one of those multiple choice, you know, which of these three things are right uh, kind of questions. You know, I love those questions. Mm -hmm. Now, difficulty of accepting reality. All the characters, and then this will be a key thing to remember as well, all three major characters have a problem with this, which is why this is the most important theme of the story. You've got a character who's trying to figure out where they fit in. And when they realize they don't fit in or they get under a lot of stress, they retreat uh, back to their own little protected place. Uh, what the characters call it is a world of illusion. So that phrase is real important for you there at the top. So whenever you get worried or stressed out, it's like finding your little happy place along the way. Where do you go to escape everything where you don't have to worry and you feel safe and secure and comfortable again? For Amanda, who's the mother, whenever she gets stressed out, she starts talking about her childhood when she was dating all these handsome men and trying to figure out who she was going to marry because that was her happiest time in her life. The problem with that is she gets stressed out a lot. So her kids, Tom and Laura, hear this story over and over and over and over again, and they know when she gets angry that there's going to be a story about some dating at the churchyard back in the 1910s coming along the way and it's going to bore them to tears. But that's her thing. She retreats back to the memories of her youth. Tom, on the other hand, is the escape artist. Whenever he gets mad and upset, he leaves. He gets out of there. He leaves the scene entirely. He'll go to the movies, he'll go out to the bars, and he'll drink some, or he goes out to the fire escape outside the window and sits on the fire escape and smokes as a way of getting outside the apartment without actually having to really leave the apartment. He's still kind of there. He's just outside, away from everything else. And then Laura is the one, she never actually goes anywhere to escape too much, but she goes to her glass collection, the glass menagerie, her little glass figurines. The important part is in the parentheses. The reason she goes there is she feels the need to be taking care of something. That she feels important if she can take care of something, even if it's a bunch of glass figures. Uh, and so she'll go and spend time, it's like little kids playing with dolls. You know, it's a way of kind of fitting in and, and getting society and social skills worked out by playing with their dolls. It's the same idea for Laura. Now, the second one is the impossibility of true escape. If they have this idea that when things get bad, they want to escape reality, what you're trying to figure out is which character can actually escape the best. Which character does this and does it well? Which character does this and doesn't really understand what's going on? And so you would want to know what the escape is for all three of the characters. And then also want to know were they successful or not. And you got the, on this screen, you got Tom's escape here. So on Tom, when he gets trapped, he sees that he goes outside to the fire escape. Now, what he sees is his goal is he wants to be like his father. And his father, according to Tom, made the best escape, the true escape. Because not only did he leave temporarily... He extended it into a permanent leave. And so Tom wants out. He's tired of the way things are going. He's tired of listening to the grown-up dating stories of his mother. He's tired of dealing with, the, with Laura and all the problems that she has and all the issues that she has. So he just wants to leave and be done with the place. So he, uh, he believes his father has the best life. His father left the entire family, abandoned them terribly, sends him a postcard every once in a while, uh, but the picture of the dad still stays in the in the apartment. And so when Tom talks about leaving, he wants to join what's called the Merchant Marines, which is kind of like a Peace Corps would be nowadays. Go out and do community service across, around the world, travel the world, see a lot of places, and do good for everyone else. So he's got a good goal. He just can't figure out how he's going to get there. So he's been saving some money trying to get the enrollment fee so he can uh, join this Merchant Marine Corps and, and escape his family life. Now, along that same theme, Tom is trapped. Tom needs money to escape. He's in a very poor family, not making a lot of money. Every bit of money that he makes needs to be recycled through the family in order for the family to survive. So he has to keep giving what he makes, or most of what he makes, back into the family so that the family doesn't get stressed out. If the family gets stressed out, then there's kind of problems, there's issues, there's fights, there's arguments. 
And so why would you want to create more arguments if all it takes is, hey, 80% of my paycheck goes back into the family and I keep 20%. Is it worth the 80% to keep things happy? Well, to Tom, it is. But now he's saving or trying to save some on really 20% of what he earns. And he's not making much progress with that. Because every time things fall apart, he spends his money on drinking or going to the movies. So all the money he wants to save, he really can't save. The money that he should be saving has to be put back into his home to keep things happy so no one gets upset. So he's kind of stuck in all there. And so if he's really trying to escape, the question at the end is the important question. I want to highlight the last bullet point there. Is it really a true escape for him to go to the movies or go to the bars if he's constantly thinking about what the problems are at home anyway? He never really gets away from it. You know, so the idea is, uh, well, I fall into this trap a lot, and people in the modern times do this a lot, real world. You can work for eight hours a day, and when you get home, my family doesn't really want to hear about school stuff because my wife's a teacher, my kids go here. They don't want to talk about school at home. That's really hard when you've got two school teachers that come home. You know, it's just a natural conversation. It's easy to talk about what goes on at work or what homework the kids have got to do. So we try to set aside times where we get away from all that and it's kind of like you know, no school zone pretty much for a couple hours once they finish their homework or something like that. It's hard to do, uh, but you do get trapped in it quite a bit. Okay, on the, this part here, we're going away from the production notes and we're going into the actual like storyline of what goes on in the first two scenes. What you're going to see in the slides, the way I want you to kind of remember it, is if you ever see a slide that is labeled as a purpose of that scene, the purpose of the scenes is extremely important for your test questions later on. So if you see purpose, that should be a red flag for you. Make sure you highlight just about everything uh, on the purpose slides. This one just kind of sets up what's going on. We kind of knew this from yesterday's notes, so it's kind of a review of where we're going. Uh, this was a lower class St. Louis apartment, the 1930s being the setting for this. Uh, the description of the stage is really, really important. And so you have this, uh, the, it's called a flat or an apartment set up where on one side you've got the kitchen and dining room area, kind of a back uh, upstage a little bit. You've got the, uh, the couch and the sitting room. And then off on one side will be through one door as a bedroom. And then you've got the fire escape cut out where characters will literally enter and exit the apartment through the fire escape window, which gets really awkward at times, but it's for Tom's benefit to where he can escape kind of quickly through that window. And sometimes when they want to sneak in, they'll sneak in through the fire escape so that they don't hear them coming through. Now, I'm trying to picture that. Most 1940s fire escapes, those old rickety metal ones you've seen in the movies sometimes, that's going to be noisy, I would think, if you're climbing up the fire escape trying to sneak in. But Tom uses it to get in and out pretty quickly. The one thing I want you to highlight for sure on this slide is the fourth bullet point down from the top. It's the ironic use of a fire escape. Uh, the characters are going to use the fire escape as an escape from all the fires of the emotional arguments that are going on. So when it gets heated, no pun intended, uh, on the inside, they leave with the fire escape. If it gets too bad, you know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen kind of approach, this is what Tom does. He goes outside onto the fire escape to escape all the heated arguments that take place inside. So it's, and it's intentionally done that way uh, by Tennessee Williams. Everybody good there? Okay. Purpose slide. Highlight, highlight, highlight. Big one right here. You got three things, three purposes for the first two scenes. And the first one is you want to introduce the strictness <coughs> and the attempt at control by Amanda over her kids. You're going to see this just about in every scene. Uh, you're going to see uh, Amanda try to take over the family. And she's going to do it in various ways. What you're going to see here is that she gets mad at Tom because Tom tries to play the role of the man of the house. And this is the part that critics never really got uh, with Glass Menagerie. You would think, with the father not being there, that Amanda would not mind Tom playing the role of the man of the house. The problem is, Amanda doesn't think he's doing a very good job at it. So if you're going to be the man of the house, be the man of the house. Don't be the guy that runs away and hides every time we have an argument. Uh, so she kind of has a problem with that. And it says he fails sometimes, it pretty much he fails like all the time, uh, trying to be the man of the house. The second part, which is the last bullet point down here, is it says, her, says Amanda's <laughs> concern for the lack of gentleman callers for Laura. In other words, she's afraid that Laura is never going to get married, that Laura is going to be stuck at home, 
and she have no future whatsoever. I think in the back of her mind, she's thinking, boy, I hope she doesn't end up like me. You know, I'm stuck here. My husband has left. My kids don't seem to be appreciative of what's going on. There's all kinds of arguments going on. Nothing's ever settled. It's always up in chaos. And so now she doesn't want Laura to have the same problem. So those three really, really important purposes. Now, if you're going to summarize the action of the two scenes, you can do that in a couple of things here, a couple of slides. Uh, Tom, you have to remember who Tom is here. Tom is not only a main character who's the brother of Laura, he's also acting like the narrator. And the quote that you see here, you want to highlight the quote as him explaining what he is going to do for the play. So he comes out on stage near the beginning, and he says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take whatever license I need to with dramatic convention and whatever is convenient to my purposes. If you put that into simpler English, I'm going to do whatever it takes to tell you my story, and I'm going to make sure you understand that this is my story. Okay. When you hear that, what's the first thing you might come to mind? It's like, I'm going to tell you a story, but it's my story. What should you automatically assume? Bias. Bias, exactly. You're not getting the entire story. It's not that he's coming out there and saying, what I'm about to tell you is true. What I'm about to tell you is the entire story of my family. He never says that. He says, I'm going to do whatever's convenient to my purpose to tell you my story. It should be a red flag automatically. This is not going to be the entire story. Something's missing. By the time you get to the fourth or fifth scene, you'll probably figure out what's missing. There's something he's leaving out along the way. It's probably about him. Now, going through the actual events of, this, of the actual two scenes, Tom is explaining something in the very beginning of the scene. It's like he's taking the time to do a little background. So that when you're watching the play as an audience member, if it's the first time you've seen the play, he's making sure you understand the backstory a little bit. Not really a flashback, but it's kind of like, here's the thing, things we're dealing with uh, as a family at this time. He talks about the Depression a little bit. You know, we are talking about late 1930s, so we're, we're within about 10 years' time of getting past the uh, Great Depression of 1929. 1920s being a horrible decade for them. The St. Louis area, of course, besides areas in the Northeast, St. Louis, if you look it up in history, was struck very hard. Uh, by the depression because of all the industrial workers that are in that area uh, and so the st louis area was still recovering maybe a little bit more slowly than other areas of the country were uh, from the depression so once he tells you what the background is he then tells the audience well here's what i'm going to do for you remember he's already said this is my story from my point of view i'm going to do things for my convenience he even says i'm kind of like a manager uh, than a narrator i'm going to like guide you through these events so if you have a guide who may be or may not be biased, he's going to show you exactly what he wants you to see, and that's really all you're going to get. So you kind of have to read between the lines a couple of times uh, and see if you can figure out the rest of the story uh, instead of what Tom is actually telling you. Uh, at the end of this, uh, well, the like middle of scene one, really, he refers the audience to the picture of his father on the wall. And he saves that one for last because we know in the back of his mind he thinks his father has done the right thing. He's abandoned them. He's the one that did what he wanted to do. He's the one that got out. I kind of want to be like him. It's his way of giving a little bit of a clue that if I'm doing things for my convenience and I think my father escaped perfectly, then I'm trying to be like him. And hopefully you'll see how that works out. He abandoned the family, sent a postcard from Mexico every once in a while, Amanda thinks that's okay. She's still kind of mad at him, but she understands it. I'd get out too, she says, if I could get out, but she's stuck. Now, in the first two scenes, this is the most important part of the scene. Doesn't mean you have to highlight everything. Just remember that the dinner table scene is like the first chance you get to see all the characters interact together. Uh, what, what Tennessee Williams is after, uh, he explained this later on after the play was produced, he wanted to recreate what it was like at his own dinner table. Now, think back to Tennessee Williams' life. He had rough, abusive father relationship. His mother was like the controlling factor of the family. His siblings, he got along with sort of not the greatest relationship, not the worst relationship, his average. So he wants to recreate that uh, in this dinner table scene in the first two parts. So you've got Amanda telling Tom, we're having dinner now. You need to get over here and eat with us. 
Sounds like my house a lot of times. Don't eat, don't eat at the couch. Don't eat at the bar. You know, come over to the main table. Let's all sit together and have dinner time together, which hardly ever happens anymore, it seems like. And when, they, when he finally sits down, you can almost see him, like, slamming the plate down, you know, slumping back in the seat a little bit. Of course, this is the guy who's the man of the house, trying to act like he's the man. And he slumps in his seat, and she starts nagging him. The way you chew, you're eating too fast. The way you live your life is awful. No wonder he doesn't want to come and sit at the table. Every time he sits down, he gets nagged. You know, there's probably a wife or mother comment in there somewhere you could throw in, but I'm going to avoid that one. You know, it's too easy to go down that road. And Tom just gets madder and madder and madder. So well, he's probably thinking it's a time for a fire escape moment. You know, I need to get out of here. But he doesn't leave. He's going to be respectful. And then Laura comes up and tells, I'm sorry, Laura wants to leave the table, but Amanda tells her that she needs to stay. And Laura says, well, why do I have to stay? And she gives a very interesting answer. You need to stay at the table so that you are currently fresh in case a gentleman comes to call on you. Mm-hmm. Now, where you know what that's going to lead to is the story about her youth again. Here comes the story of all the men that I dated when I was growing up. And you can just see the eyes like roll back in the heads of, of Laura and Tom like, oh, brother, here it comes again for the 67th time this month. You know, she's going to tell us about all the men she dated and all these wonderful stories. Uh, but she thinks, well, Laura's bound to find someone uh, pretty soon. So Amanda goes into this big, long story. And the key part here is the second bullet point. It's very ritualized. It's very memorized. You can tell she's told this story before. Think about grandparents. You've probably had grandparents do this to you. You go to the grandparents for holidays uh, and they say, well, I remember back when, and you know when they say that phrase, just kind of par- pull up a chair uh, and park for a while. It's going to be a long story. You know you've heard it before, but you're supposed to sit there and nod and smile and say, yeah, that's, that's, I remember that. That was great. And you're just like, when's the story ever going to be over? Uh, and eventually, 25 minutes later, the story ends and you can go on and do what you want to do. But you're being respectful to the person who's older. So Tom and Laura are trying to be respectful but they're kind of like, well, what do you mean you only had two men that day? Why didn't you have five men come calling you? And it's really kind of being annoying. But Amanda doesn't even see it that way. She thinks they're actually interested. I mean, they're not interested at all. At the end of that scene, uh, Laura has to be a little bit of a smart aleck and say, you know, uh, Mom, I don't have men court me like you did. I must not be as popular and attractive as you were. You must have been the perfect woman back in your day. It's okay. If you think of that, there's kind of an insult thrown in there. I'm not nearly as young and attractive now as you were then. So it kind of implied, well, you've kind of like fallen a wayside. You're not attractive. You're not desirable anymore, especially like you were back then. So that could be a problem for her. Tom, at the end of the story, has to ask the question that they're all wondering, why do you have to tell us all these stories? when you know that we don't like them. So he's being a smart aleck too. And Amanda says, you will listen to these stories, and you will like them, of course, which is not going to help. And Tom says, well, we've never liked them in the first place. Uh, And so the argument comes up. You know Tom's about to escape. The mom's getting insulted. It's just kind of an ugly time. So if this is the typical dinner table scene of Tennessee Williams, no wonder he has all kinds of family issues. If this is what happened every time he sits down. He's got problems with arguments. Now, scene two comes in. It's one of the shorter scenes in the entire play. The purpose here, there's that purpose slide for you again. Make sure you get these three things highlighted. We're going to find out that Laura is actually kind of sneaky. It seems like she's kind of a pushover in the first scene, but she's kind of got an ulterior motive uh, set up. She's a very crafty person when it comes to what she tries to do. She's supposed to have been going to business college classes during the daytime a certain number of times a week so that she can learn how to type and like be a secretary and get a job in an office somewhere and actually be responsible uh, in life. And so the mother, Amanda, has been paying for these classes. When she goes out, supposedly going to the classes, she's not actually been going to the classes. Uh, She's been going to the park. She's going to watch the movies. If it's cold, she'll go to a museum and see the artwork and the paintings and the sculptures and spend the entire day out there having fun and goofing off, using the money for the class to pay for the things that she wants to do. And then she'll come home and she'll act like she's studying her lessons with her typewriter chart that's on the wall to play the part of I'm being the good student, I'm doing my homework now. 
Why would you spend your free time with a dreamer? That's her. She's well. She's a dreamer. Thing is, she's a, she collects the glass figures, so she likes to see the sculptures along with things that she would like to have in her collection. Plus, it's really cold outside sometimes too. Now, when um, when she comes home, uh, she is discovered one time. Her Amanda discovers that she's actually been disobeying her. And the problem was uh, that when she went to school the first day, and we'll get to this in a second, when she went to first school the first day, she got so nervous that she physically got sick and threw up in the classroom and decided she would never go back. So on the rest of the purpose scenes, Amanda is telling Laura the purpose of the scene is you need to go to these college classes because if you don't, look at the only option she's got left. The only option is well, to get married and start having kids. That's all Amanda knows. So if you don't go to college and don't find you a decent job, which leads to a decent husband, then you're going to get married to some poor idiot. You're going to have a couple of kids. You're going to be stuck like me. And she doesn't want that to be the case. Notice the problem in all of this. No men, it seems like forever, uh, have been paying attention to Laura as potential dating material. And so another reason, she's not going to the classes to learn how to get a job. She's going to the classes to find a husband. At least it's what Amanda thinks should actually happen. Whether she gets any skills or not, doesn't really matter at this point. She's hoping that she can find a husband. And then also at the end of scene two, we discover the handicap that Laura actually has. Uh, she has a disease called pleurosis, which leads to her school nickname of Blue Roses, which we'll explain how that happens in a second. Everybody good there? No. Yeah. Anyone's got it, Brian? He's not I know. Usually he's done with his notes by now. So. I like my anti-Brock notes. It's a good setup. Quiet. I'll just say I don't like it too much either. Oh, well. I'll delete yours then. You can just not use something there. It'll be fine. Whoa. That's what I thought. I, mean, I thought I heard that. So. Okay. All right, going through the, the last couple of slides here will be the plot details for scene two. This is the screen device we talked about in the introduction on the production style, what, what Tennessee Williams likes to do on stage. He projects the picture of blue roses up on the screen, opens up the scene with Laura is kind of polishing the glass figures, and a minute she hears her mother coming back in, I believe it's from the grocery store at that point, uh, and she starts putting the glass figures away, almost like she's embarrassed by them, because like, she wants she's supposed to be studying her lessons. So she pulls down the keyboard chart, and she's pretending to actually, like she's you know, doing the finger motions for typing, and uh, I'm busy, Mom. I'm really doing my homework. Yeah, very clever. You know, yeah. you would think. Yeah, you would think if she's coming up the fire escape, that she could probably hear that. Now, the keyboard chart that she's talking about, though, was actually like a little wooden board that was the shape of a typewriter. You could practice the keyboard strokes without actually having a typewriter there. So she's doing the motions without actually clicking on that. So she's trying to look like she's doing her work, but it's not actually going very well. When she comes in, mom is so upset. And this is a wooden board chart. She breaks the chart. Uh, mom does when she just kind of, I can, I can just see this happening, you know, taking the board over the knee or across the wall, you know, making and breaking the chart so that she can't use the chart anymore. Probably not the smartest thing mom's ever done because she's paid for that for the classes. And now she realizes, well, you're not going anyway. I guess you don't need the chart. And she gets very upset about her skipping classes. So I went down to your school today. I was going to surprise you and show up at school. I met the teacher. She said, yeah, your name has been on the roster, but you've only been there one time. And the teacher remembered you getting sick and throwing up in the aisle uh, and then running out of the classroom and never come back. And she wants to know the whole story. And, of course, Laura tells the whole story. Yeah. You forgot the footage you did. I did? Where's that? The first time this test when you got physically oh okay I'm typing a little fast and when she got physically sick then yeah okay I'll, I'll delete your notes too then be fine, so. you you and Alex can go down together so. all right all right at least you know what I meant that's good all right also on the plot details uh, Amanda's gonna tell her that uh, since her career is ruined no she just discovered the problem now. So you've wasted all my time. You've wasted all my money. Your career is over. You're not going to be anything anymore. That's the great pep talk you want to hear from your mom. Okay. And now all you can do now is get married. I can see a, a Laura now. Uh, problem, mom. Uh, you want me to get married? I don't have anybody I'm dating. And says, well, tell me about all the boys that you've liked. And, and danger, danger, you know, 
men I've liked before. Here comes the story about Amanda and all her boyfriends again. Tell me what you think, Laura, about all the men that you would like to date. And Laura decides, if I don't want to hear the story of my mom's life for the 112th time, I better come up with something. And says, well, there was this one guy named Jim back in high school that was my crush. But I never could really get Jim's attention that much because he saw her and asked her why she was you know, ill all the time. And she said, well, I have this problem called pleurosis. And Jim misheard that, thought she said, well, I have blue roses. And so that's where her nickname came from. So he kind of made fun of her. And so this is the crush that she wanted to date in high school. Never could get the date with Jim because Jim was always in the popular crowd. And then kind of made fun of her for her problems. Wait, not not a good setup. Yeah. Sorry. That one there? Like one more? One, yeah, before that. Okay. Wait, what does fluorosis make you look like? It gives you, it's kind of like a uh, crippling disease where you have to wear leg braces. I'm looking at that. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, what, that's a good reaction for it there. Hey. All right. So now th at the end of the scene too, here's what happens at the very end. Uh, the part you want to highlight is the last three bullet points of this slide. The most important part of scene two. You have the dinner table scene being the most important part of scene one. This reaction from uh, Laura and Amanda is the most important part for you. Laura says, well, I was reading the paper the other day, and I saw that Jim had gotten engaged. So if he got engaged a little while ago, he's probably married by now, so we can just forget about Jim. And she's thinking, that wasn't real smart to say, because now she's probably going to talk about her boyfriends again. But Jim's kind of out of the picture. And Amanda says, don't worry about it. Someday your prince will come, kind of line here. You know, the guy is going to come along. The perfect man is out there for you. Don't worry about it. And then Laura says the worst thing that she could say to her mother. What did you say to her mother again? The last three. Last three bullets. She says, but mom, I'm crippled. Right. Uh, you know, kind of like a dum-dum-dum. And mom's like, don't ever say that again. I don't want you to ever use that word. Because if she never uses the word... What can mom do? If mom says don't use that word, why does she not want that word used? Believing in herself. Well, believing in herself is one part, but she doesn't have to accept what? The yeah, the fact that she's crippled never has to be accepted by mom if she never actually hears the word crippled coming out of Laura's mouth. Now, what she says at the end, if you want a nice young man to court you, you have to do something. You have to cultivate culture. In other words, she just implied to her daughter, to her face, you are an uncultured person. That's why nobody wants to have anything to do with you. So she's told her, your career's over. you got to find a guy to marry. But wait a minute. Nobody likes you. You're crippled, and you need to have no culture. Same. Yeah, so, yeah, that's going really well for mom. That's not going to go over really well. Okay. Last slide of the day, then we're done. Let me just make sure I got the right one. Yeah, I think it's the last slide. Yeah, is there, is there two on your list there? Two, two for important analysis? Okay, let me, let me try to hurry to get there because I'm almost out of time. Three slides? Okay. I don't have a presentation thing that shows me. I'll leave these up there so you can get them copied in so you have all the notes. Uh, the key here is, if you're going to summarize what the important part of the scene would be, is it, is it, is it going to be biased or not? So is what you just saw in scene one and two completely accurate? Of course, if Tom is telling the story, where's Tom? Yeah, so now, Tom, if Tom was not present to see all this, he has to get it secondhand. So you have to kind of wonder how accurate it really is in the, to begin with. There's a comparison made to Shakespearean plays about a chorus coming out, but this time the chorus is not actually a character or in, in the play. Am okay. I good there? I'm going to try to skip to the last two. I think it's 30 today. So yeah, we got a little bit. I'm just trying to hurry. Go, go, go. Okay. Next one there. I'll leave it so you can get those copied in. Uh, Tom is still the narrator. Uh, the key to highlight here is that first bullet point. I'm going to highlight the first one as being important. Uh, he speaks as someone that is set in the future looking back with a supposed emotional detachment. He's supposed to be the narrator and the manager. He's supposed to keep himself out of the action as much as possible and just tell you what's going on, but he likes to get in the way. So he's having difficulty... Uh, doing that and being unbiased because he is a character in the play. And of course now uh, the audience is going to question, is he really telling us the truth? And at the end, when he starts getting the audience's trust, he changes. He says before the play ever starts, you can trust me. I'm the narrator. I'm the manager. And then he has that scene at the dinner table where he's very immature. 
if I'm an audience member and you try to judge, do I like this guy or not? He tells me I'm supposed to like him, and then he acts like an idiot at the dinner table. And then he runs away every time he gets mad. So you got to see, is there some buy-in there or not uh, for Tom? Okay. Good? Everybody's good? Uh, if he portrays himself in a bad way, it probably makes it like, more like, reliable, right? Probably. If he's showing you some of his negative side, he's tend, I, would, I would tend to give him a little bit of credit for that. Because he could have very easily made himself look perfect at the dinner table and decided he wanted to show the bad side. So you got to give him a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of credit for that. Was this the last one? Yes. Uh-huh. All right. Highlight this one for me at the very top. There's a quote you're going to see in almost every one of the, the scenes we're going to deal with about truth disguised as illusion. This is kind of what you're getting at, Malin, on this one. He's going to show you something that he says is truth, but sometimes it's real, and sometimes it's exaggerated, and sometimes it's a mixture of that, of that. Uh, whether he's actually telling you what's actually going on or not. The first bullet point is the one you want to make sure that you mark. All right, the way this will work for you uh, the rest of the week while you're finishing up on this slide, the quiz that you have on block day covers the reading of scenes one and two, today's notes, and the background notes. It's the longest quiz we have. It's 20 questions, uh, uh, half a point each for a 10-point quiz. It'll be on paper. Uh, is mostly multiple choice. No essays. No essays. Mostly multiple choice. Oh yes. Uh, before the bell rings, I need to see book checks for you as well. If you'll hold up your copy of the book for me, that way I can make sure you've got it with you. I think Taylor's is there. Good, 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 good. Actually, got yours in there somewhere. Brock, you're good. Alex, Ashley's good. Good, good, good. Books for y'all, Gabby. Gabby. Books for y'all. These notes are trash. Books. Yeah, Wait, I got mine. Can I got it with you? Uh, yeah. No, you keep them. Oh, my. What? Really? These notes are Yeah, these notes are funny. We still got a couple minutes. Y'all can wait a second. Wait, this is the last one. That's my favorite. Okay.